Hello, this lecture is going to be covering chapter 32, Environmental Emergencies. So for introduction here, we've got uh, medical emergencies that can re uh, result from environmental factors. Um, certain populations certainly are at, at higher risk for these environmental emergencies. So anytime that we have uh, or we're dispatched to an emergency um, that has um, you know something to do with environmental factors, certainly take note of the um, you know the age of uh, of the patient, children, older people, um, folks with chronic illnesses, uh, young adults who overexert themselves. Those are all um, more at risk uh, populations for environmental emergencies. So some different um, categories of environmental um, environmental emergencies, um, heat and cold related, um, water emergencies, pressure related emergencies or injuries, um, including diving um, and altitude type, uh, type uh, illnesses or injuries, injuries caused by lightning, and then uh, envenomation, which is bites or stings. Um, we'll talk about all of those uh, different types of emergencies. Factors ex uh, affecting the exposure, um, the physical condition of the, of the patient, um, certainly the age of the patient, as I mentioned before, infants, children, and older adults, um, much more likely to experience temperature-related illnesses. Uh, when we're in the early stages of our life and the later stages of our life, uh, we don't have, um, usually we don't have the, the fat supplies, we don't have, um, you know, the mechanisms, the body mass to um, overcome some of those temperature-related emergencies or excuse me, temperature-rated illnesses. Um, nutrition and hydration, um, a lack of food or water will aggravate any ho um, hot or cold stress uh, upon your body. Some different environmental conditions, conditions that comp can complement, uh, excuse me, complicate or improve environmental situations. Um, extremes in temperatures and humidity are not needed to produce injuries. Um, we'll talk about this when we discuss um, hypothermia and hyperthermia. Uh, you don't need you don't necessarily need extremes in those temperatures um, for you to have um, a heat or cold related um, injury or emergency. Um, sometimes we see um, folks that are out in the sun for a long period of time, even though the weather might be, you know, 75, 80 degrees out, but they're out in the sun actively, you know, uh, uh, involved in sports or something like that. And they end up with with uh, a heat emergency because of that, even though the temperature really really wasn't that extreme. All right, so we'll start off with cold exposure. Cold exposure may cause injury uh, to feet, hands, ears, nose, um, or potentially the whole body. Starts with those appendages, though. Starts with your hands, feet, um, ears, and nose. Um, there's less blood flow in those in those areas of our body. Uh, there's less mass in those areas of our body, and so those become affected by the cold um, exposure. Um, quicker. There are five ways the body can lose heat. Conduction, convection, evaporation, radiation, and respiration. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, the rate and the amount of heat loss or gain by the body can be modified in, in three different ways. So it can increase uh, or decrease in heat production. Um, you can move to an area where heat loss can be decreased or increased or you can wear the appropriate clothing for the environment. So I'll talk about each of these. Your body can um, automatically increase or decrease heat production, and that's where we talk about shivering. If you're in a cold environment and you start shivering, your muscles start, that, that twitching motion, they're generating heat, they're producing heat. So that's your body's way of, of increasing that heat production to overcome the cold exposure. We can move to an area where heat loss can be decreased or increased. So one of the first things that we're going to do in any of these environmental emergencies is get that patient out of that environment. So if you respond somewhere and it's very cold outside and you've got somebody who's exposed to that cold, one of the first things you're going to do after ensuring you, your ABCs are intact is get that person into the heated medic. So that's, the, you know, or, or a heated building or somewhere um, out of that, uh, you know, um, cold temperature. So that's one of the first things you're going to want to do. And then wear appropriate clothing for the environment. Certainly, um, that's a way to, to, uh, to conserve your, your body heat. Um, hypothermia. So hypothermia or low body temperature uh, defined as a core temperature that falls below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Um, the body loses the ability to regulate its temperature and generate body heat, um, so the body just continually gets colder and colder. Eventually, key organs such as the heart begin to slow, so you're going to see uh, bradycardia, you're going to see uh, slow heart rate, you're going to see an uh, altered mental status. Their mental status is going to deteriorate as they get colder. Obviously, this can um, certainly lead to death. The air temperature does not have to be below freezing for it to occur. Technically, the air temperature just has to be uh, below your body temperature. And then that coupled with the fact that your body cannot overcome that temperature. So there's a range there. Most of us um, have no problem compensating, you know, down into the, the, the 40s and the 50s. But you get much below that, and then our body has a tough time if we're not wearing the appropriate clothing or if we're not healthy, if we're in one of those high-risk uh, age groups, we, we have a hard time compensating for that cold of temperature. But really, you know, any temperature below your body temperature, um, it has the ability to start cooling you. Um, if, if you don't have the ability to warm yourself up beyond that, then you're going to be exposed to potential hypothermia. So uh, some more people at risk here. Homeless people and those who uh, whose homes lack heating, um, we, we encounter this a lot in the winter uh, winter time. A um, lot of homeless folks, uh, it, you know, if you're running in an area where uh, where there is a, a, a higher higher than the normal homeless population, um, a lot of these folks just don't have a place to go, um, and so they're out um, in this environment in these cold temperatures, and and we get a lot of calls uh, for hypothermia for for those homeless folks. Um, swimmers, so anybody swimming in, in uh, cool water, or well, cool or cold water, certainly at risk for hypothermia. Uh, and then and then those um, at-risk age groups, uh, at-risk individuals, geriatrics, pediatrics, and, and anyone who's, who's suffering from some other uh, illness. Signs and symptoms become more severe as the core temperature falls. So as the temperature gets lower, those sim the sim signs and symptoms are exacerbated. They get worse and worse. He progressed through four general stages, and um, we'll look at these at these uh, at this uh, chart here at this table, and, and you can see based on the temperature um, what this person is going to be looking like. So, if their core temperature is anywhere between ninety and ninety five degrees. You're going to see shivering, foot stamping. That's where you're kind of jumping up and down. They're still shivering. Um, their bod their body is still attempting to cool. Or excuse me, to warm them up. Um, you're going to notice constricted blood vessels, rapid breathing, and they're going to be a little withdrawn as far as their consciousness, but they're not confused yet. They're still pretty with it. They just don't really want to talk to you because they're more concerned with trying to get themselves warmed up. Uh, then if we move down to, to uh, 89 to, to roughly 92 degrees uh, core temperature, um, you're going to see loss of coordination. The muscles no longer are shivering. You start to get some muscle stiffness. Uh, the respiration slow, the pulse slows, everything starts to slow down. The patient becomes confused, lethargic, they um, appear very sleepy. So we move down that uh, temperature scale there, 80 to 88 degrees. Uh, we, this is where the patient's going to become comatose. Um, you may have a very weak pulse, um, heart dysrhythmias, very slow respirations. Um, and this patient's more than likely going to be unresponsive at these temperatures. If we get any below 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that is where the patient's going to go into cardiac arrest. Um, assess the general temperature um, by, by uh, simply placing your, your back of your hand on the patient. Um, they talk here about um, removing your glove and placing the back of your hand on their abdomen. That gives you an idea of their core temperature. Certainly, we're going to get the thermometer out as well and, and, and check the Mild hypothermia occurs when the core temperature is uh, between 90 and 95. Uh, more severe hypothermia occurs when the temperature is uh, core temperature is less than 90. Um, never assume that a cold, pulseless patient is dead. So there's a there's a saying in EMS um, that goes, you, "You're not uh, dead until you're warm and dead." So if we encounter a patient who is uh, hypothermic and they appear to be in cardiac arrest we're not going to assume that that patient's dead uh, until they've been properly rewarmed, and then, and then we can make that determination. So uh, we transport a lot of folks who are, are uh, pulseless, um, you know, um, cold, they've been out in the elements, uh, they appear to be in cardiac arrest. 
Uh, we're still going to transport those patients. We're not going to pronounce them on scene. Um, we're still going to work them and get them to the hospital. Now, there is one um, exception there, and that is when um, a body is, is frozen solid. So if, if you've got a body that's actually frozen solid to the point where you wouldn't even be able to do compressions, obviously we're not going to, that person's obviously dead. Uh, we're not going to need to worry about getting them warmed up uh, before we make that declaration. But uh, never assume that a cold, pulseless patient is dead. All right, as far as um, the local injuries that you may see uh, from, from cold exposure, um, they're confined. generally these injuries are confined to parts of the body. And like I mentioned before, hands, feet, nose, um, ears, that's where we typically see these local cold injuries. So there you're seeing some evidence of some frostbite um, in the hands, tip of the nose, and, and in the toes there. Important factors in determining the severity of a local cold injury, um, duration of the exposure, so how long have they been exposed, um, temperature to which the body part was exposed, what's the, what's the temperature outside, were they in water, um, what's the temperature of the water. All those things are important. Um, wind velocity during the exposure, the wind can, uh, can make these cold injuries a lot worse. Um, excuse me, we use... Um, Convection is is uh, is the the way that the body's going to lose heat through um, through wind exposure, and so the wind velocity is really important to know. Uh, not necessarily the exact speed of the of the wind, but just knowing that um, yeah, there was high winds tonight as well, uh, along with the cold. That's going to allow us to assume that this exposure is more severe. And then any underlying factors, exposure to wet conditions. Uh, we're going to talk about in the treatment of of um, cold exposures, one of the first things we need to do um, is get rid of wet clothing. So exposing them being exposed to wet conditions, wet clothing, it's going to make um, the cold exposure a lot, a lot worse. Inadequate insulation from colder winds. So obviously if they're out, uh, somebody's out in the elements without the proper um, uh, uh, clothing insulation um, away from, from, from that cold or wind. Uh, restricted circulation from tight clothing or shoes. Um, if a patient has circulatory disease, it's certainly going to make things worse. So, uh, again, as the population gets older, um, those folks are more at risk, not just because of their age, but because of these underlying conditions, underlying factors that they have. They, you know, A lot of older folks have circulatory disease. They don't have as much circulation, as much blood flow going through their extremities. Um, so, obviously, that's going to make... Um, Things like frostbite, uh, these cold injuries, um, they're, they're going to make them more susceptible to those. Um, fatigue, poor nutrition, um, alcohol or drug abuse. Um, alcohol and, and some drug abuse um, inhibits the body's ability to, to, uh, to feel the temperature change. So if the patient is, um, is, is hypothermic, and they, they're, they're a, a chronic alcoholic, they're, they've been drinking a lot tonight, we see this a lot on, on uh, college campuses um, in the winter when, when uh, kids are out drinking, um, they get, they get um, you know, they get intoxicated and they pass out on the sidewalk. Well, they don't have the ability uh, to know that their body is that cold. So then at that point, uh, they go into, you know, potential for, for these local cold injuries or hypothermia. Uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and then age. We talked about uh, age a lot, and then these these uh, comorbidities, these other other um, you know medical conditions certainly make things worse. Um, frost snip um, after prolonged exposure to the cold, um, skin may freeze while deeper tissues are unaffected. Um, it's called frost snip or frostbite. Um, usually affects the ears, nose, and fingers. Um, usually not painful, so the patient is often unaware that a cold injury has, has even occurred. Immersion foot um, occurs after prolonged exposure to cold water. It's common in hikers and hunters. Uh, if there's any, um, if, if you're in the military, you're probably aware of immersion foot. Um, you know, folks that do long hikes in the cold, if their socks get wet, that's why the, one of the most important things to have is dry socks. If your socks get wet, you have the potential for this uh, this condition called immersion foot. All right, so here's a picture of some frostbite. Um, this is the most serious local cold injury because the tissues are actually frozen. So the tissues themselves actually freeze. 
and the, and when the tissues freeze, the cells die. Um, so there's the potential for um, gangrene, which is uh, uh, dead tissue that's that's uh, that's now infected, uh, which is going to require surgery to remove that that dead tissue. Um, the skin depth, or excuse me, the depth of the skin uh, damage will vary with superficial frostbite or or frost uh, frost nip is what they call that. Um, only the skin is frozen. The top layer with deep frostbite, deeper tissues are frozen. So you've got uh, uh, bigger problems, right? You've got more um, mass, more tissues that are affected uh, with deep frostbite. And as far as your scene size up goes, um, be sure to note the weather conditions outside. Um, so as you're, you know, I've talked about in the past, um, you know, your, your, your size up starts with dispatch, right? It starts really in the morning. It starts when you get to work. What's the weather out like today? Uh, you know, is it, a, is it a bitterly cold day? Because we're going to assume that at some point today, we're going to deal with a patient who's dealing with a cold emergency. Is it a super hot day? Is it, you know, very, very hot out? Um, you know, all those weather conditions, that's all important. So, so take note of that as you're, you know, even before the runs come out, take note of those kind of things as you're coming into work. Um, ensure that the scene is safe for you and other responders. Certainly, make sure that you've got proper uh, proper protection on. So, if you're you're in cold environments, you know, make sure that you have gloves on, that you have uh, you know a proper coat on. Um, identify any other safety hazards: icy roads, mud, or wet grass, um, and then use the standard precautions, like I mentioned. Um, you know, making sure to have a hat and, and gloves and a coat on. As far as your primary assessment goes. Going to form a general impression here. We're going to perform a rapid exam. Certainly, if a life threat exists, like with any patient, we've talked about this a hundred times now. ABCs treat the ABCs right away. Um, evaluate mental status using the AVPU scale, um, and, and evaluating the mental status is going to give you a, a quick picture as far as a cold emergency goes, as to whether or not this person's hypothermic. Um, if they're if they're truly hypothermic, they're they're going to have an altered mental status. So that's a real quick check to see. All right, are we dealing with with a hypothermic? Patients in cardiac arrest begin compressions. Um, ensure that the patient has an adequate airway and breathing. ABCs, as always. You can warm and humidify the oxygen if possible. I'll be honest, not very many um, EMS uh, departments, fire departments, carry warmed and humidified oxygen. Some do have humidified oxygen, but rarely do you see uh, warmed oxygen. But if you have that, you can certainly use that. Um, palpate a carotid pulse, and it talks about waiting up to 60 seconds to decide if the patient's pulse is. Patients that are hypothermic, a lot of times it's very difficult to feel for that pulse. Uh, it's cold out. It's, it's uh, you know, they're, they're, they're potentially, they're, they're hypotensive. Um, palpate that carotid, and, they're, and they're, their heart rate's probably very low. So palpate the carotid pulse for a good 60 seconds before you determine if they're, if they're actually pulseless. American Heart Association recommends CPR be started on a patient who has no detectable pulse of breathing. You already know that. Um, just keep in mind that uh, perfusion will be compromised because of the, the cold, um, because of the, the, uh, the potential hypothermia. And then bleeding may be difficult to find. So uh, you're going to have to expose this patient again, get them into a warm environment and expose them. As far as your transport decision goes, complications can include cardiac dysrhythmias, all patients with hypothermia require immediate transport. Um, these, if a patient has hypothermia, they cannot stay home. They need to get to the hospital. They need to get to the hospital because uh, uh, they need to be properly rewarmed. Rough handling of a hypothermic patient can cause a heart to go into fibrillation. So you want to be easy with these patients. You don't want to toss them onto the cot and get them into the medic and drive you know, down the bumpiest road you possibly can. You need to be easy with them as you're handling a hypothermic patient. Hypothermia causes heart dysrhythmias. That's exacerbated when we, uh, when when that patient moves around. As far as your history taking goes, obviously we're going to investigate the chief complaint, obtain a medical history, um, be alert uh, for injury specific signs and symptoms, and then any pertinent negatives. Find out how long they've been exposed to the court environment. And that's, you know, simply by asking them or people around them, how, hey, how long have they been out here? How long have they been out with, you know, without a jacket, without, uh, you know, proper, proper uh, protection from the cold? As far as your secondary assessment goes, 
physical examinations, you want to focus on the severity of the hypothermia. So getting a good temperature, um, ensuring uh, that you're assessing each area of the body that's affected. So I want to make sure that I get a, a good recap of, all right, well, where do they have frostbite? Um, you know, what, what parts of their body are affected by this, um, assess the degree and extent of the damage, um, and then pay special attention to the, the uh, skin temperatures, textures, and turgor. Um, vital signs may be altered by the effects of hypothermia and can be an indicator of its severity. So uh, respirations may be slow and shallow. The blood pressure may be low. They may be uh, hypotensive. Slow pulse um, in, indicates moderate to severe hypothermia. Uh, and then evaluate those changes in mental status. As I mentioned before, as the patient becomes more hypothermic, they're going to be less aware of their situation. As far as reassessment goes for these patients, you're going to re, uh, repeat the primary assessment, uh, vital signs, chief complaint. certainly want to monitor their level of consciousness. Um, as we rewarm them or as they are rewarmed themselves, that can, can lead to some cardiac dysrhythmia. So ensure that you're keeping a close eye on the patient. Um, you know, this would be a case where you, you could hook up and transmit that, that 12 lead. You know, you can have the, the cardiac monitor on this patient. Um, certainly reviewing all treatments that you performed as well. Uh, so general management of, of cold emergencies. Um, first off, in one of the most important things you can do is move the patient from the cold environment and get their wet clothing off. That's going to help them tremendously. So get them out of the environment, get rid of their wet clothing, and then place dry blankets um, all around the patient. So you want to completely surround them in dry blankets. Um, there are some, um, uh, some medics that have uh, uh, blanket warmers. Um, the hospitals have them. Some ambulances do carry them. Some companies do carry them. Um, I wouldn't say it's very common in, in, as far as pre-hospital EMS, but if you do have warm blankets, you could certainly use those. Um, if, if available, um, give the patient warm humidified oxygen. Again, I talked about that not very common as far as pre-hospital EMS. Handle them gently. Um, don't massage extremities. If you notice frostbite, uh, just leave it alone. Just just leave it alone. Um, you're going to cover it in a, in a dry dressing, um, but we're not going to be massaging it. Uh, you know, some people think that, you know, the, the typical response of rubbing something to get it to get it to warm up is appropriate here, and that's not the case if there's frostbite. Um, do not allow the, the patient to eat um, or use any stimulants. As far as mild hypothermia, management of mild hypothermia, the patient's going to be alert. Uh, they're going to sh still be shivering at this point. They're going to be responding appropriately. Best thing for that person, get them into a warm environment, get rid of their wet clothing. Certainly apply heat packs if you have them, uh, hot water bottles. Um, you could certainly um, give them warm fluids by mouth as long as they're they're not um, they're not nauseous as long as they don't have a, a risk of vomiting. <clears throat> as far as moderate or severe hypothermia goes for for the management, um, we're not going to actively rewarm this patient. We're going to um, only passively rewarm them. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, further. Actively re rewarming versus passively rewarming. Actively rewarming is when we are giving them um, something to drink that's warm, uh, maybe warm, you know, as far as the, the uh, paramedic scope of practice, warm, warm IV fluids, those types of things where we're actually giving them warmth internally, you know, helping them to warm up by giving them uh, warm fluids, those kind of things. Passively rewarming is simply... Uh, you know, doing things that's going to help their body rewarm itself, putting blankets on them, getting them into, uh, you know, a heated area, getting them in, into the medic so that, so that they can warm up that way. That's passively rewarming. So if it's moderate or severe hypothermia, we're only going to want to passively rewarm. The, the reason behind that is we don't want to warm them up too quickly because that's, there's a, a, a risk for um, dysrhythmia, heart dysrhythmias. So uh, no active rewarming with, with a moderate or severe uh, hypothermic patient. Remove the patient from the cold environment. We already talked about that. And then, and then uh, as always, again, part of passive rewarming, get rid of their wet clothing, cover them with a blanket. 
Oh, we already talked about removing them from um, the cold. Uh, as, oh, this, sorry, this is as far as local uh, cold or injuries go. Um, same thing. Get them out of the cold first. Um, take care of the injured part. You know, handle it gently, protect it from further injury. Um, remove any wet or restricting clothing, clothing over the injured part. If they've got any jewelry on that can be easily removed, go ahead and remove that so that if the patient starts swelling, um, we don't have any issues there. Um, if transport's delayed, as far as a local cold injury goes, consider you can consider active rewarming um, if it's just a local cold injury if the transport is delayed. Here in Central Ohio, we don't do this very often because we've got hospitals all over the place. If you happen to work somewhere where you've got a, a long transport time, you may need to consider some active rewarming. With frost nip, contact with warm object may be all that's needed. So putting that 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 you know finger that has some frost snip on it onto a, a, a warm a warm uh, um, you know a heat pack that may be all that's needed uh, with something like immersion foot getting their wet shoes their socks off rewarm that foot gradually you know using um, warm blankets warm towels uh, heat packs uh, do not re-expose the injury to the cold um, so these are the patients that, you know, even if even if they, they feel better after being rewarmed, they still need to go to the hospital because we don't want them to go back out into the cold environment um, and re-expose that injury. And then, as my, I mentioned before, never rub or massage the injured tissues. So you can immerse the, the frostbitten part in water. And again, this is only if only if your transport is delayed. This is active rewarming. So this is only if the transport is delayed. We're not typically going to do this, but you can immerse um, the frostbitten part in water between 102 and 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we'd want to dress the area with a dry sterile dressing. If there are blisters that have formed, do not break the blisters. Let them, uh, you know, if, if they break themselves, that's fine, but do not break uh, the blisters if, the, if blisters are formed. And then never attempt rewarming if there's any chance that the, the part may freeze again. So it can cause a, the, the, the freeze-thaw process can cause a lot of damage. So if, that, if this person has the, the potential to, to freeze again, we don't want to start rewarming. That's not really as applicable for us because we're going to get them into a warm ambulance. We're going to get them to the hospital. But if, you, <clears throat> if you're a, a wilderness-type person, you're out. Um, you know, doing some hiking or something like that, you get stuck in a, you know, you get stuck in a, in a bad situation and you've got some frostbite. You don't want to, you don't want to, um, you wouldn't want to, you know, start a fire, you know, get some water warmed up, thaw that, that frostbitten part out only to let it freeze again, because it's going to make the damage a lot worse. All right. So switching gears here to heat exposure. Um, in a hot environment, the body tries to rid itself of excess heat. It does this by, uh, by sweating. Um, and then the evaporation of the sweat causes cooling, um, causes, or excuse me, uh, uh, tries to rid itself of heat with dilation of blood vessels. So the skin's going to get warm and hot. The skin's going to get warm, red and hot because the blood vessels are dilating, causing more blood flow to the surface of the skin and allow that, trying to allow that body heat to, to dissipate. Um, removal of clothing and relocation to a cold, cooler environment. So just conversely from, from cold exposure, if this person's out in a, in a hot environment, we need to get them into the air conditioning. Hyperthermia is a core temperature of 101 Fahrenheit or higher. Risk, fact, risk factors of heat uh, illness include high air temperature, so uh, reduces the, the possibility of radiating that heat off of you. Um, high humidity, which reduces the evaporation of the sweat from the skin. So those cause, that's why if you're in a, a high humid um, area, it feels much worse because you, your sweat is not evaporating off. So that's why a high humidity area is a, a, a definitely a risk factor. Um, lack of acclimation to the heat. So if you, you know, you're used to staying inside in the air conditioning and then all of a sudden you expose yourself to very hot temperatures for a while, you're not acclimated to that, kind of shocks your system a little bit. And then vigorous exercise. So you've got a loss of uh, uh, fluid, you've got a loss of electrolytes, and certainly you're increasing your core body temperature by, by being active.
Um, persons at greater risk for heat illness uh, or greater greatest risk for heat illness, um, just like with uh, with cold, um, younger patients, older patients, patients with comorbidities, heart disease, COPD, diabetes, dehydration, obesity, and then patients with limited mobility. Patients with limited mobility have issues because they may be stuck in the sun and they can't get out of that uh, because of their mobility issues. All right, so we'll start off with heat cramps. Um, heat cramps is going to be the, the most mild form of a heat exposure um, emergency. Painful muscle spasms that occur after vis- vigorous exercise. Um, they don't only occur when it's hot outdoors, um, but they occur, you know, majority of the time when it is hot out hot, hot outdoors. Uh, exact cause of the cramps not not really well understood, um, but they usually occur in the leg or abdominal muscles. Heat exhaustion is the most common illness caused by heat. Um, it causes overheating of the body, excessive time in a hot environment, and a lack of hydration. Um, some signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion, fatigue, warm skin, sweating, cramping, um, tachypnea, so they're breathing fast. Uh, remember that with a heat exhaustion patient, they are still sweating. Their body is still trying to compensate. Still trying to compensate. It's still trying to cool itself down. The skin is just the skin is warm. It's not quite hot yet. It's just warm, and they're still sweating. So that's the big differentiator between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So let's talk about heat stroke. Heat stroke's the least common, but it's the most serious illness caused by heat exposure. Um, it occurs when the body is uh, subjected to more heat than it can handle, and the normal mechanisms of reducing that heat are overwhelmed. So the body's tried to sweat. Uh, try to, to reduce the body temperature, but it, it, it no longer can. Um, this can. This can happen sometimes when the patient's dehydrated. Uh, they don't have any more fluid to produce sweat. Um, untreated heat stroke always results in, uh, in death. Heat stroke's a very, very severe, very serious condition. Uh, a lot of people think that they, they may have had heat stroke. Uh, it's not very common to see heat stroke. A lot of times it's just heat exhaustion, but if you do see heat stroke, true heat stroke, um, this is a, a very, very severe, uh, very serious uh, illness. It needs to be taken, taken, uh, uh, not taken lightly. Typical onset situations um, during vigorous physical activity, certainly out in the heat in a closed, poorly ventilated, humid space um, during heat waves without sufficient sufficient air conditioning or poor ventilation. Uh, and then, and then we see this uh, with the children that are left unattended in a locked car on a hot day. <clears throat> um, so, some signs and symptoms of heat stroke, um, as I mentioned, with heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion, you have warm skin; they're still sweating. With heat stroke, their skin is going to be red, hot, and dry. So that's what you're going to see with heat stroke. They're going to have altered mental status. Um, they're going to be fatigued, potentially. Conscious, and their skin is going to be red hot, and uh, and it's going to be dry. All right. So as far as uh, heat emergencies go, scene size up. Uh, as with the cold emergencies, perform an uh, environmental assessment. Is what do I need to do to keep myself safe in this heat? Uh, keep in mind the heat emergency may be secondary to a medical or a trauma emergency, so they may have um, fallen outside while while hiking. And they were they were no longer able to get out of the sun because of the fall, because they broke their leg or whatever the case may be. So maybe secondary to some other issue. <clears throat> Certainly consider calling ALS. Protect yourself from the heat, as I mentioned before, um, and then use all your standard precautions um, for for these patients, as with any. Uh, as far as your general impression goes, observe how the patient interacts with you in the environment. Certainly, uh, mental status check is important. Uh, Avoid uh, avoid tunnel vision on these patients. You know, try to try to maintain a, a look at the big picture here. Um, what's going on? Are they heat exhaustion? Are they heat stroke? What what exactly is happening? As far as airway and breathing goes, unless the patient's unresponsive, the airway should be patent. Um, nausea or vomiting may occur. Position the patient to protect their airway, um, and if they're unresponsive as far as airway and breathing goes, ensure that they're being properly ventilated. All right, circulation, um, if adequate circulation, assess for perfusion and bleeding, so um, assess their their skin condition, really. 
Um, treat for shock uh, if necessary. A uh, little chart here with, with um, skin conditions um, and what that's indicating. Uh, moist, pale skin, or excuse me, moist, pale, cool skin. That's excessive fluid and salt loss, but that's not necessarily a bad thing if they're in the heat, right? We would, we'd be okay with that. Um, as long as we're able to replace those fluids and salts, um, we're okay with that. Hot, dry skin, body's unable to regulate its core temperature. That's the heat stroke patients. And then hot, moist skin, that's more like your heat exhaustion patients. Um, it's unable to, to regulate the core temperature, but it's still moist. It's still trying. As far as your history goes, investigate the chief complaint. Um, be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms. Um, sample history, note the activities. What, what were they doing? Do they have any underlying conditions or medications? Um, the ex what determined the exposure to the heat and humidity and, and what activities they were performing? So how long have they been outside? Uh, when you know when's the last time they had anything to drink? Is there is there uh, you know are they properly hydrated? Those kind of things. Um, as far as your secondary assessment goes, um, assess patient for muscle cramps, um, assess them for confusion. That's going to be um, all indicators that there's there's a heat related um, illness going on here. Um, certainly examine their mental status, skin temperature, and moisture. Keep a close eye on that. See if what we're doing is working, right? If, if we've got them into the air conditioning, into the cool air conditioning, have, have they, you know, is their skin started to cool down a little bit now? That's all positive, right? That's good. Or taking steps in the right direction. Um, perform a careful neurologic examination. As, as uh, with any of these heat or cold-related emergencies, ultramental status is going to be a big, uh, a big sign uh, that they're having one of these um, temperature extremes. As far as vital signs go, patients who are hyperthermic, so high body temperature, will be uh, tachycardic and tachypnic. So they're going to be um, have high heart rates, high uh, respiratory rates. Their blood pressure, uh, if their blood pressure is falling, that's a, a good indication that the patient's going into shock. We're certainly going to treat them for shock, um, keep them in the supine position at that point. In, in heat exhaustion patients, skin temperature may be normal, cool, or clammy. Again, heat stroke, skin is hot, generally hot and dry. As far as your reassessment goes, um, keep a close eye for deterioration. Patients with symptoms of heat stroke should be transported. Um, monitor vital signs every five minutes, both heat and cold emergencies. Um, you're going to want to do reassessments every five minutes. And certainly with anything, evaluate our effectiveness of our interventions. Is their skin cooling down? Are they feeling any better? Have they started to sweat now? Those kind of things. Uh, be careful not to overcool a patient. Um, we see this, uh, um, you know, every every now and then get a little bit um, aggressive with with cooling. We get out some ice packs. We get out, uh, uh, you know, cool towels, and and you just put all this, you know, cold water and, and ice on this person, and then they start shivering. Well, that's not that's not helping the problem. We're we're kind of counter counterintuitive there. So make sure to not overcool them. Um, inform the staff at the receiving facility early on that your patient's experiencing a heat stroke. There are certain protocols that they're going to follow um, that need to, to, you know, to have some time to, to get going. Um, so certainly notify them ahead of time. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with any of these environmental issues, document the weather conditions um, prior to your onset. As far as uh, management of these uh, emergencies, heat cramps, um, you want to remove the patient from the hot environment. That's going to be the you know one of the first things we're going to do with any of these uh, patients, but but particularly for heat cramps, get them out of the hot environment. You can administer high flow O2 if, if it's indicated. Um, have the patient sit down or lie down. You certainly don't want them you know working their muscles any more than they have to. So get them to relax. Um, if it's just heat cramps, you can replace some fluids by mouth as long as they're not nosh, uh, nauseous, uh, as long as they're not at risk for vomiting. And then you can cool them with a water spray or a mist, cool towels, those types of things. All right, heat stroke, management of heat stroke. First thing, move the patient out of the hot environment. Get them into the, into the ambulance with the air conditioning on. You know, one of the things that um, you know, I always pay attention to during the summer and, and winter months during the heat extreme and cool extremes is, um, is, is I want to always make sure that the medics are, are uh, keeping the air conditioning or the heater, you know, whenever, whichever is appropriate, 
on in the back of the box. So a lot of the ambulances, you're going to have controls for the, the cab and you're going to have controls for the box for the back. Um, and, and occasionally you'll see some folks that ride around and they don't think about it and they've got the air conditioning going in the cab and they feel fine. But the back of the box is, is you know, turning into a, a hot box back there. So then you go on a patient who, who needs, you know, cool down and you get him into the back of the medic and it takes you, you know, a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes to get the, to get the, to the box cooled down. Well, that's not appropriate. So make sure that during the hottest months, during the coolest months that you're, you're getting the temperature in the box appropriate before you even get these runs. So make sure those, uh, those things are taken care of. Um, remove their clothing, uh, administer high flow to if um, indicated, and then, you know, as, as always with, with our ABCs, assistive ventilations as needed. This patient may be unconscious, unresponsive, uh, so certainly assist their ventilations if needed. Um, you can cover uh, the heat stroke patient with wet towels or sheets. You can aggressively fan the patient, you know, put the put the air conditioning blower directly on them. Um we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to uh, cover them in, in, in like an ice bath or anything like that. That's going to cool them too quickly. Um, but, but using wet towels or sheets is, is appropriate. Um, exclude other causes of altered mental status. So we mentioned before, um, you know, there's, there's potential that, that this patient's having a heat emergency because of an underlying medical condition, something like diabetes, where, where they're confused and they don't uh, they didn't know to get themselves out of, uh, out of the heat. Um, so that's a potential. So, so exclude all those other causes, check their blood sugar, you know, perform a stroke exam, you know, check for all of those, uh, other, all those other underlying conditions. Um, transport immediately to the hospital uh, for the heat stroke patients. <clears throat> all right. Drowning, um, drowning is the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion, immersion in liquid. Um, some risk factors for drowning, alcohol consumption, uh, pre-existing seizure disorders, geriatric patients with cardiovascular disease, and then unsupervised access to water. And that's particularly important for the uh, pediatric population. Submersion incidents um, may be complicated by spinal fractures or spinal cord injuries. This happens a lot with folks who are diving into pools. Folks that are jumping off of uh, cliffs into quarries, those types of things. Um, the, there's a quarry in in, in uh, Columbus uh, that that there's at least at least one every year, every summer, at least one um, person dies from from diving off the quarry, uh, diving off the cliffs into the water, and, and they suffer a spinal cord injury. Um, so so fairly common. Assume a spinal uh, injury if submersion has resulted from diving mishap or a long fall, as I mentioned before. If the patient is unconscious, if the patient complains of weakness, paralysis, or numbness in, in any of their extremities, assume that there's a spinal cord injury there. Uh, we want to stabilize that injury in the water. So keep in mind, if there is a potential for a spinal cord injury, we're going to need a, a lot of help to, to uh, ensure that uh, we can enter the water. Uh, and then once we're in the water, we need to make sure to stabilize those injuries. As far as water rescue goes, um, there's a there's a, a little saying that we use um, in not only EMS but in the fire service, and that's reach, throw, row, and then only go. And excuse me, and only then go. Um, and and what this is telling you here is the this is basically the order of operations for how you're going to rescue somebody who is um, in a body of water. The first thing you're going to do is try to reach for them. And that can be with your hand. That can be reaching with a, you know, if you've got a, a long stick or, or a, a pike pole or something that you can, you can put out into the water to reach for them. That's the first thing you want to do. You want to do that from the, the bank. Um, throw, you can throw a rope bag at them. You can throw a buoy at them. You can throw anything that they can hold, grab onto and you can pull them out of the water. Again, that's going to happen from the bank. If that's not a possibility, then, um, we row. So you can get into a boat and, and go out and try to get them that way. And then the last option that you have would be to actually enter the water yourself. And this is reserved for only the cases where, there's no other way to save this person's life than to risk your own by going into the water. So I'm not going to make you guys, uh, you know, water rescue uh, techs from this class. If that's something that you're interested in, certainly 
um, later on, uh, you know, in, in your career, you can you can certainly exper- explore those types of things. Um, but uh, for for now, you know, leave this to the the professionals in that field. Um, so the best thing that you can do if you're dispatched on any sort of water rescue is make sure that the proper resources are on their way. Um, do not attempt a swimming rescue unless you're trained and experienced in the proper techniques, as I mentioned before. If the patient is not floating or visible in the water, specialized personnel required with snorkel, mask, scuba gear. Scuba gear. Um, as far as resuscitation efforts go, never give up on, a resusc- on resuscitating a cold water drowning victim. That's how what I mentioned before was um, we're not going to pronounce a patient dead unless they're uh, warm and dead. So uh, in the cold, in cold environments, particularly in cold water, body does a really good job at shutting down non-vital organs. There's actually been cases uh, where a patient has survived long exposure of uh, cardiac arrest in a cold environment you know, upwards of, of, of an hour or more where they've been in cardiac arrest, but their body has been cooled to the point where it's almost, um, you know, it's almost stood still in time. And then they can resuscitate them properly at the right temperatures and actually save that person's life. So any hypothermic patient, um, you know, they can protect those vital organs from the lack of oxygen and they can survive a lot longer. The diving reflex cause, may cause immediate uh, bradycardia. Um, when you submerge, when your face gets submerged in cold water, it's called the the mammalian diving reflex. Um, it causes a, a quick bout of bradycardia. So, someone with an underlying heart condition, they may dive into a cool, a cold or cool pool, and that could cause them some issues going into bradycardia very quickly like that. All right, so I'll briefly talk about some descent emergencies. Um, this is caused by the sudden increase in pressure as the person dives deeper into the water. So this is for scuba divers, uh, free divers, people who are going into um, depths of greater than an atmosphere, which is, I believe, about 33 feet. Um, the pain forces uh, the diver to return to the surface to equalize the pressure, and the problem clears itself up. So as you dive, if any of you are scuba divers, you probably know as, as you dive, as you get deeper than, than, that, than that first atmosphere, um, it, it starts to, to get very painful for you, um, until you until you can, can equalize that pressure. So um, these patients that have uh, pain that ca- forces them to the surface, you want to monitor them to see if they continue to have that pain. If they continue to have the pain, then they need to be transported to the hospital um, to, to assess what's causing that. Uh, emergencies at the bottom, um, rarely occur, but it is possible if you work somewhere where you've got a deep diving, um, area, you know, there's some quarries around, there's some different places, um, uh, Gilboa, Twin Lakes, there's, there's a handful of different places where folks dive here in Ohio. Um, and, and if you, if you're working around one of those areas, I, I certainly recommend that you reach out to them. Um, and get yourself some additional training on on dive related emergencies. But if, if there is an emergency at the bottom, it's typically caused by a, a, some sort of a faulty connection or problem with the diving gear. There is um, some mixing of of the uh, air that they breathe. Sometimes it's a, a mix of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Sometimes it's a mixture mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. Um, if there's an inadequate mixture, that's going to obviously cause a problem. Um, ascent emergencies. So ascent emergencies are um, problems when a diver is, is ascending um, from deep depths. Um, these are uh, uh, these problems usually require um, aggressive resuscitation. Some of the problems that you may see with these patients: air embolism. Um, this is the most dangerous and most common um, scuba scuba diving emergency. So as a patient, as a person comes out from depths. Um, they were at high pressures when they were under the water below an atmosphere. And when they come quickly out of those depths, those the, the release of pressure in their body causes bubbles, these bubbles to form in the blood vessels. It's um, the way it was described to me that I, I thought was a good way is if you, when you open up like a two liter bottle of pop, um, that bottle was under pressure. So you can assume that that's how the person's body is at a deep depth. When you release that by opening the bottle of pop, that 
releases that pressure very quickly and it causes all those bubbles of, of carbon dioxide to form. Essentially the same thing happens in your body. So as you release that pressure very, very quickly, all these little uh, bubbles form in the blood vessels and that can cause air embolisms, can cause air pressure in the lungs and that is um, called the bends. So this is decompression sickness is what we're talking about here. It obstructs blood vessels, it causes pain, it causes pain in the joints, um, and, it, and it's caused by uh, too rapid of an ascent from, from a dive. Um, or too long a dive at too deep of a depth. So um, if any of you are divers, you know there's, there's dive calculations, there's dive charts that you have to follow. You can only be at certain depths for a certain amount of times. Uh, you can only have so many repeated dives in a short period of time. And if you exceed those, that's when you have the potential for um, contracting the bends. You may find it difficult to distinguish between an air embolism and decompression sickness. Air embolisms generally occur immediately uh, on the return to surface, whereas decompression sickness may not occur for several hours. So knowing the, the time of onset is going to give you an idea of whether it's air embolism or decompression sickness. Either way, they're both serious dive emergencies. That person needs to go to the hospital. Um, treatment, for the, both, treatment for them both is the same. Um, they need recompression in a hyperbaric chamber. Um, at this point in central Ohio, um, all hospitals are recommending that regardless of, uh, of what's going on with the patient, whether they need a hyperbaric chamber or not, you should transport them to the closest hospital and then they will transport them to the closest hyperbaric chamber. Only certain hospitals have certain hyperbaric chambers, and I don't have a comprehensive list at this point because it does change frequently, but I know that OSU has one for sure. Um, I'm not sure of the other hospitals in Central Ohio that do, but the best thing to do is get this person to a hospital, allow the physicians to stabilize them, and then they can get them to the hyperbaric chamber. All right, scene size up, scene safety is always important. Especially in, in any water emergencies, uh, we want to ensure that our safety is important. Never attempt a water rescue without the proper training, proper equipment. Call for those additional resources early. So you may have to get a dive team on the way. Um, you may need to consider trauma or spinal immobilization for these patients. So a lot to think about with the scene size up of any of these uh, water emergencies. Form a general impression, um, pay attention to chest pain, dyspnea, complaints of sensory changes, um, determine the level of consciousness using the APU scale like we always do, uh, be suspicious of drug or alcohol use. So if you've got a, a, a patient who's had a near drowning event or um, you know, some sort of um, issue in the water, um, you know, in, a lot of times those, ca those are caused by, by alcohol use, patients intoxicated. They're not, they don't have the normal ability that they, that they usually have to swim. Um, so, so be suspicious of those types of things. Airway and breathing, open the airway, assess breathing, especially in your drowning victims. You need to open the airway, assess for breathing, um, initiate CPR if necessary. Consider spinal trauma and take the appropriate actions for that. Um, suction if the patient has vomited. Provide ventilations or high, high flow O2 if necessary and auscultate and monitor breath sounds, especially, again, especially in those drowning victims. Monitoring breath sounds, auscultating is going to be incredibly important. Circulation, it may be difficult to find a pulse, but if you don't have a pulse, begin CPR, apply your AED. Remember when applying an AED, we need to make sure that the patient's chest is relatively dry, so make sure to have a towel handy, towel close by to dry off their chest. Evaluate for shock and perfusion, and then if the MOI, the mechanism of injury, suggests trauma, Always assess for bleeding and then treat that appropriately. Your transport decision: any non, uh, excuse me, any near drowning patients should be transported to the hospital. So if you go on a patient and it was reported that they're they were drowning, but they're they're okay now, they still need to be transported to the hospital. Inhalation of any amount of fluid can lead to de delayed complications, um, and this is this is. Uh, uh, Condition that you may have heard of before is called dry drowning. Patient um, inhales some water into their lungs. They're able to, uh, you know, survive this initial event. You know, they cough the water up. Someone does, you know, someone uh, maybe does some compressions on them. Whatever the case may be, at this point, they're breathing. They appear to be fine. One, you know, 
one day, 12 hours, 24 hours, maybe two days from now, this person ends up with severe respiratory distress and they end up going into cardiac arrest. They end up going into respiratory and then cardiac arrest. And what happened there, what, what, what the problem was, is that that water getting into the lungs irritated the lungs and caused the lungs to start to swell up and you started some pulmonary edema. So the lungs started to swell up with fluid. And so over a period of about 12 to 24 hours, that patient then had severe swelling, uh, severe amount of fluid, pulmonary edema, and it caused them to essentially drown in their own fluids. And that was caused by the irritation of um, in, in, inhaling a whole bunch of water. Um, so any, any of these near drowning patients, they need to go to the hospital. Decompression sickness and air embolism must be treated in those recompression um, uh, hyperbaric chambers. As far as the chief complaint, um, obtain a medical history, be alert for injury, specific signs or symptoms, conduct a good sample history. If this is a dive incident, uh, you know, determine the depth of the dive, how long they were down there, the time of the onset of their symptoms, any previous diving activity, all of those things are important to pass along to the hospital because that's going to determine whether or not they're a candidate for the, the hyperbaric chamber. And it's going to determine what kind of treatments they need to perform at the hospital. As far as your secondary assessment goes, examine lungs and breath sounds with any of these patients. This is important, uh, especially when we're around water, um, you know, maintaining a good, a good handle on their, their, their uh, breath sounds is important. Look for hidden life threats and trauma. Again, indications of the bends air embolism, pain in the joints, just general pain around the body, um, and then signs of hypothermia. Anytime they're in the water, most most water, especially around Ohio, is not at body temperature, which means they're susceptible, they're at risk for hypothermia. Um, assess for peripheral pulses, skin color, discoloration, itching, pain, numbness, or tingling. As far as their vital signs go, check their pulse rate, quality, rhythm. Uh, respiratory rate, quality and rhythm, listen to lung sounds, you know, listen to lung sounds, uh, uh, you know, constantly, um, assess pupil size and reactivity. Um, as far as monitoring devices goes, oxygen saturations readings, excuse me, oxygen saturation readings may be inaccurate. Hi, this is caused by hypoperfusion, shivering, um, the, the blood flow is not getting, uh, there's not, they're not, they're not perfusing well into their, into their fingertips. So you may not get a good uh, O2 sat. Um, as far as your reassessment goes, repeat the primary assessment. Um, drowning uh, patients may deteriorate rapidly because of um, lung issues, pulmonary injuries. Um, fluid shifts in the body. Cerebral hypoxia, so their, their brain is hypoxic. Um, they're not getting enough oxygen to their brain. It's going to cause them to de deteriorate rapidly. And then hypothermia. Again, especially in Ohio, most of the water uh, throughout the year is not at body temperature, so they're at risk for hypothermia. Pneumothorax, air embolism, or decompression sickness patients um, may also decompensate quickly. So if you're, if you're concerned about any of those, um, ensure that you're closely reassessing them as you rapidly transport them to the hospital. Document everything. Uh, I mentioned before with the drownings and, and uh, things like that, time submerged. Uh, so, you know, if, if it's a diving incident, time, you know, time of the dive, how deep did they go, those kind of things. Temperature, clarity of the water. Clarity of the water tells us, you know, all right, what kind of water did they did they possibly inhale? What kind of water got into their lungs? Is, is this person going to need to be put on a broad spectrum antibiotic? Or was this, you know, relatively clean water? You know, those kind of things. Uh, document any, any uh, spine injuries and then bring... If it's a dive injury, dive illness, uh, bring the dive log, bring their dive computer. All that equipment needs to come to the hospital with them because it's going to get. That's going to tell them the operators of the hyperbaric chamber. It's going to give them a lot of guidance on on um, how long they need to be in the, the hyperbaric chamber. Immobilize and protect the patient's spine if a fall or a diving injury is is possible. Patients not breathing, make sure to clear their airway. Uh, BVM, as always, uh, provide chest compressions, use an AED. Certainly treat for hypothermia as well. For air embolism or decompression sickness for the bends, in a, in a conscious patient, make sure, first off, we're getting them out of the water. Get them into the medic, get them warmed up, try to keep them calm. 
can emit us some oxygen. Um, certainly going to monitor their breath sounds for, you know, there's possibility of a pneumothorax there. And then you're just going to provide them prompt transport for patient with decompression sickness. The only thing they need is hyperbaric chamber. Uh, us, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to provide any treatments for them uh, pre-hospital. Uh, appropriate precautions can prevent most immersion incidents. Um, so think about this, you know, you, if you run on somebody um, who maybe had a near drowning event, this may be a, a time to uh, time to start educating. Um, pools should be surrounded by a fence. Um, the most common problem for child drownings is lack of adult supervision. And then half of all teenage and adult drownings are associated with the use of alcohol. So you know, consider those risk factors as you're arriving on the scene. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly touch through some of these high altitude illnesses. Um, this is not something that we're going to uh, necessarily deal with in the state of Ohio. Uh, if you happen to move somewhere, um, Colorado, you know, in the Rockies, somewhere where they have the potential for some high altitude illnesses, you know, certainly wouldn't hesitate to, to you know, brush up on some of these things. Um, but I'm going to pretty much, uh, you know, slide through these pretty, pretty quickly here. Um, we don't have many altitudes in Ohio that are, are high enough to cause any sort of altitude illness. Uh, but altitude illness is caused by diminished oxygen in the air at high altitudes. So the oxygen molecules are spread apart further at high altitude. It's a lower pressure. Um, and so it causes some of these illnesses, effects to uh, the central nervous system and the, and the pulmonary system. It's a condition called acute mountain sickness or AMS. Uh, it's a diminished oxygen in the blood. It's caused by ascending too high, too fast, or not being uh, acclimatized, acclimatized excuse me, to the high altitudes. It's not acclimated, you're not acclimated to the high altitudes yet. Um, the best course of treatment for AMS is to descend or stop ascending. So stop climbing higher or start coming down. So your body's, you're not getting enough oxygen molecules into the blood. All right, there's another condition called high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE. And there's another condition called high altitude cerebral edema called HACE, HAPE and HACE. Um, HAPE, high altitude pulmonary edema. So think about pulmonary edema. This is fluid collecting in the lungs. It's, it hinders the passage of oxygen into the bloodstream. All right, so some signs and symptoms of high altitude pulmonary edema uh, would be difficulty breathing, uh, crackles in the lung sounds, uh, low oxygen saturation, confusion, altered mental status. High altitude cerebral edema, uh, this may accompany uh, HAPE, um, but in, can quickly become life-threatening. Symptoms are, are uh, pretty similar, really. It's pretty hard for us to, to detect the difference between the two. The biggest thing, really, is, is to listen to lung sounds. If it's high-altitude pulmonary edema, you're going to hear uh, rails and crackles in the lungs um, versus just high-altitude cerebral edema, which is, is uh, um, essentially fluid on, in the brain, fluid swelling in the brain. Uh, you're not going to hear that, the, 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 uh, the lung sounds. All right, so uh, give you a minute to, to pause the video and read through um, this chart. It just gives you some more information about these three uh, different altitude illnesses. I, kinda, I like this chart. It, it breaks it down. Take a second. Look at the chart. I'm not going to go through it individually. If this is something that you're more interested in, certainly study this chart a little bit more. If, you, if you're going to go live somewhere where you've got high altitude potential, um, you know, certainly uh, pay attention to these things a little bit more. All right, let's talk about lightning. Um, targets of direct lightning strikes, uh, people engaged in outdoor activities, boaters, swimmers, golfers, um, anyone in a large open area. So lightning always takes the path of least resistance. Generally, that's uh, something that's 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 high, elevated above the ground. If you're out in a large open field, you might be the highest elevation in that area. Many individuals are indirectly struck when standing near an object that has been struck by lightning, such as a tree. This we see this a lot with golfers. I shouldn't say we see this a lot, but this this happens with golfers. Um, they're they're standing next to trees, 
they get the tree gets struck by lightning and then a, a you know a small amount of that that lightning strike branches out and 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 uh and goes through them as well the cardiovascular nervous systems are most commonly injured respiratory or cardiac arrest is the most common cause of uh, lightning related deaths categories of lightning injuries mild moderate and severe and this is not really something that, that you're going to diagnose. Any patient who is struck by lightning or potentially struck by lightning is going to get transported rapidly to the hospital, um, and, and you're going to you're going to uh, you know maintain their ABCs. That's really all we're going to do for that patient. Uh, as far as your medical care, protect yourself. Move them to a sheltered area. Talk about using reverse triage. No, we haven't talked a lot about triage yet. Normal triage is when we've got a, 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 a multitude of victims, so more victims than we have rescuers. Okay, so we have to triage these patients. Normal triage, we find the patients who are dead or close to dead, and we discard them. We, 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 we don't treat them because there's more people that need our help, and those patients we can for lack of a better term, we start to write them off, right? That, that patient who's in cardiac arrest already from, uh, you know, from an explosion, let's say this was like a, 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 a terrorist event, there's an explosion. If, that, if there's a patient that's, that's already dead, the likelihood of us saving them is very little. So we're going we're gonna to move on past that patient. We triage by passing that patient and going to a patient who we can actually save or attempt to save. For lightning strike, we'll go we'll go th way more into depth with triage later, uh, in another chapter. With lightning strikes, we do something called reverse triage, and in this case, we treat cardiac arrest victims first. And the reason we do this is because if you survive a lightning strike, if you are if you get struck by lightning or you know a small branch of lightning, and you are and at this point you're alive, your heart has not stopped you're not likely to go into cardiac arrest from that. If you've survived it, you've survived it. So that's, so for the, for lightning strikes, we use reverse triage. We actually go to the cardiac arrest victims first. We try to revive them uh, with CPR. The others are not likely to develop cardiac arrest. All right, so um, treatment for, for lightning, uh, lightning strikes, cardiac arrest care, getting, you know, the AED on them, starting CPR. That's what's going to save their life. Uh, and then treating their burns and injuries, that's secondary. All right, so we'll switch towards um, uh, some envenomation stuff here. Um, spider bites, spiders are numerous and widespread in the United States. Um, only the female black widow spider and the brown recluse uh, spider deliver serious, even life-threatening bites. So those are the only two in the United States, uh, naturally, that are in the United States, um, that are going to cause um, serious or life-threatening injuries. Uh, as far as black widow spider, um, the female, uh, fairly large, measuring a, approximately two inches across, usually black with a distinctive bright red-orange uh, marking in the shape of an hourglass on its abdomen. Black widow uh, spiders prefer dry, dim places. Um, sometimes the bite can be overlooked. Uh, most bites cause localized pain and symptoms, including agonizing uh, muscle spasms. So the venom from a black widow is a neurotoxic. So it uh, is toxic to the neuropathways, which is where we're going to have agonizing, painful muscle spasm. And then these symptoms are going to become systemic because it's attacking the, the, the um, it's attacking your, your, yeah, your neurosystem. Uh, generally, these symptoms subside over about 48 hours. Emergency treatment consists of BLS, for, so any patient who's in respiratory distress, because it's attacking the nervous system, there's a possibility that it's going to affect their breathing, and you're going to maintain their ABCs. You're going to ventilate them if necessary, uh, and we're going to transport them as soon as possible. <clears throat> um, it says bring a, the spider or a photo of it to the hospital. With any, um, with any uh, run that you guys are going to go on, the first thing we always think about is scene safety. I'm not going to sit around and try to uh, collect a spider that potentially it caused this person to go, you know, have, go into cardiac arrest or have have a, a, a severe illness from from its bite. Um, if we can snap a photo of it, great. If not, 
uh, you know, if, if somebody's killed it already, you can certainly scoop it up and bring it with you. Um, if not, you can just describe it. All right, the brown recluse spider. Uh, it's dull brown in color, about one inch long. Uh, it's got a violin-shaped uh, mark on its back. Um, you can see that here. It looks like a violin right there. Um, live mostly in southern and central parts of the country. We do have these in Ohio. Um, they tend to live in dark areas. Uh, the venom differs from black widows. Black widows are a neurotoxin, so it attacks the nervous system. The venom of a brown recluse is cytotoxic, so it attacks cells. It attacks local tissues. So it causes severe local tissue damage. Um, typically, the bite is not painful at first, but becomes so within hours as the tissue starts to die. The area becomes swollen and tender, uh, develops a pale mottled cyanotic um, center. All right, so stings. Talk about bees, wasps, yellow jackets, ants. Stings are painful, but typically not a medical emergency unless that patient is allergic. If they're allergic, they may go into anaphylaxis and then it becomes an emergency. Uh, remove the stinger and the venom sack using a firm edged item, such as a credit card, uh, to scrape the stinger and the sack off the skin. Snake bites, uh, there's approximately 115 different species of snakes in the US. Only 19 of them are, are venomous, uh, rattlesnakes, copperheads, cotton mouse, water moccasins, coral snakes. Um, luckily, we don't, have, we don't have too many venomous snakes in, in Ohio, but certainly if, if you do have a patient who's been, uh, uh, who's been um, bitten by, by a snake, certainly want to try to identify that if possible, uh, because then they're, they're going to, to be able to treat them properly. Again, these are all possibilities because patients uh, may have these as pets. You know, they, they may have them or, or you know, in, in, in a zoo or, or something like that. It could be a possibility. Snakes usually don't bite unless uh, provoked, angered, or, or accidentally injured. So protect yourself from getting bitten. Extreme caution, you know, wear your proper PPE. Uh, if you've got to go into an area where there's a snake that's, that's not contained, you know, try to you know if you if, if you're in fire-based ems I'd, I'd be putting on all my fire gear just to try to remove the possibility of that snake you know c coming in contact and bite and, and biting me classic appearance of a poisonous snake snake bite is two small puncture wounds with discoloration um, swelling and pain pit vipers um rattlesnakes copperheads cotton mouse they're all pit vipers they have triangular shaped um, flat heads and they have small pits that contain poison located just behind each nostril and in front of the eye. Um, so that's the venom sac there. Um, rattlesnakes, most common form of pit viper, many different patterns uh, of color, diamond pattern. They can grow up to six feet long. Copperheads, usually two to three feet long, uh, red copper color crossed with brown and red bands. Copperhead bites are almost never fatal, but the venom can cause significant tissue damage um, to the extremities, including up to having the you know amputations. Cotton mouse, olive or brown with uh, black crossed bands and yellow undersurface. Um, water, cotton mouse are water snakes; they're very aggressive. The tissue destruction from a cotton mouth um, bite may be severe. Signs of envenomation. Include severe burning, pain at the site of the injury, swelling, and bluish discoloration. If the patient has no local signs an hour after being bitten, assume that no envenomation, uh, assume that the envenomation did not take place. So, snake can bite um, but not inject the uh, venom. And if that's the case, if, if an hour has surpassed and there's no local signs or symptoms other than the, you know, the puncture mark, uh, we're going to assume that that envenomation did not. Uh, did not take place. As far as the treatment goes for any of these, um, treat it as a deep puncture. So, uh, you know, cover up the wound um, and transport. There's nothing that we have in, in, in EMS and in pre-hospital EMS to provide this person um, other than rapid transport to the hospital. Um, coral snakes are a small reptile with a, a series of bright red and yellow black bands um, completely encircling the body. These are in southern states. Uh, I don't believe we have these in, in Ohio. Um, 
they inject uh, the venom with, with tiny fangs in a chewing motion, leaving puncture wounds. Um, they usually, they're smaller. They usually bite on a finger or a toe. Um, the coral snake's venoms pop powerful toxin and causes paralysis of the nervous system. So within a few hours of being bitten, the patient starts to exhibit bizarre behavior, and then they become paralyzed. There is an anti-venom, um, but most hospitals don't stock it. Again, hopefully we don't have to worry about a coral snake. Certainly in this area, uh, there's not going to be any antivenin available. Um, emergency care is the same for a pit viper bite, uh, treated as a puncture wound, transport rapidly to the hospital. Th they probably won't have an antivenin for it, but at least they have the ability to treat some of the symptoms, some of the swelling, some of the symptoms. Um, scorpion stings. Again, scorpions not common in Ohio, but people may have them as, as pets. Um eight-legged arachnid with a venom gland and a stinger at the end of their, their tail. They primarily live in the southwestern U.S. and in the deserts. Um, with one exception, a scorpion sting is usually very painful, but it's not dangerous. Uh, tick bites, this is something that we have. This is something that you will encounter in Ohio. Uh, ticks are tiny insects that attach themselves directly to the skin. Found most often in brush, shrubs, trees, um, sand dunes, or other animals. A lot of times uh, uh, dogs uh, can carry ticks. Dogs run around in, in the woods. If you do any hiking in the woods, um, certainly have the potential for having a tick. Um, the bite's not painful, but it can spread infectious diseases through its saliva. So Lyme disease is one of the, the most common diseases that gets spread by a tick. First symptoms are generally fever, flu-like symptoms, sometimes associated with a bullseye's rash um, that may spread to several parts of the, of the body. So the, the rash looks like a bullseye. Um, it's, got, it's, it's circular and it's got rings. It's got bands around it. Uh, painful swelling of the joint occurs. Um, and a lot of times people confuse Lyme disease with rheumatoid arthritis. So the symptoms are very similar to arthritis, pain, in the jo pain and swelling in the joints. The only difference between that and arthritis is or between Lyme disease and arthritis, is that Lyme disease is also going to produce flu-like symptoms with a fever. Uh, tick bites occur most commonly during the summer months. Um, if, if transport will be delayed, you can remove the tick. Um, you take a, a pair of fine tweezers, you grasp the head, and you pull um, straight out of the skin until the tick release, releases itself. So you don't want to knock the tick off because sometimes the head can stay, um, stay attached. You want to pull just... Just lightly until the until the skin is tinted, until the skin starts to pull pull up and pull away, and then you want to allow the tick to release itself, and then clean the clean the area. You can save the tick; they can usually identify those um, injuries from marine animals. Um, again, marine animals not something we're going to have to necessarily deal with, so I'm going to breeze through it. Um, but things like fire. Fire coil, uh, Portuguese man of war, sea wasps, sea nettles, jellyfish, these types of things can cause painful burning red marks. Um, injuries from uh, marine animals, the, the, the best treatment you can provide that person uh, is hot water. Um, they say take uh, get the person into a shower with water as hot as they can stand, um, and that's, that's the best thing for them at that point. There's some pictures of those. Again, not something we have to necessarily deal with here in, in Ohio. All right, so we'll go through some review questions and wrap up uh, environmental emergencies. Uh, number one, when a person's exposed to cold temperatures and strong winds for an extended period of time, he or she will lose heat mostly by um, radiation, convection, conduction, or evaporation. The answer here is by convection, B. Convection occurs when heat is transferred into circulating air, as when cool air moves across the body surface. Pairing a person wearing lightweight clothing, standing outside in cold, windy weather, is losing heat by convection. Just to go through these, because I think I, I, I didn't uh, quite go through each of these. Radiation is the transfer of heat by radiant injury, excuse me, radiant energy, um, conduction is the direct transfer of heat by contact. So if you touch a hot surface, that's conduction. Um, and then evaporation is the body moisture evaporating and cooling the body. So that's what happens when you're sweating. All right, number two, shivering in, in the presence of hypothermia indicates um, that the 
and I'll let you go ahead and pause the video and read those. And the answer here is C. Uh, shivering in the presence of hypothermia indicates that the body is trying to generate more heat through muscular activity. So the body's trying to warm itself up, and that's what shiver, that's the purpose of shivering. So the answer for two is C. All right, number three. All of the following are examples of passive rewarming techniques except... So I'll let you pause and read through those. And the answer to number three is B, administering warm fluids by mouth. Administering warm fluids by mouth is active cooling. All of the others are passive rewarming. So removing, removing the cold, wet clothing, that's passive. Warm fluids by mouth, that's active cooling. Excuse me, active warming. Turning up the heat inside the ambulance, passive rewarming. Covering the patient with warm blankets, passive rewarming. All right, number four, a woman has frostbite in both feet after walking several miles in a frozen field. Her feet are white, hard, and cold to the touch. Treatment at the scene should include which of the following? I'll give you a second to read through those so you can pause the video. And the number, the excuse me, the answer for number four is D, removing her wet clothing and covering her feet with dry, sterile dressing. When we treat a patient with frostbite, remove the wet clothing, cover the area with dry dressings. Do not break blisters, don't apply heat, don't try to, to, to rub the area. So rubbing the feet uh, gently, not gonna help, uh, it's gonna hurt, uh, it's gonna cause more damage to the tissues. All right, number five, a 30-year-old male who has been playing softball all day in a hot environment complains of weakness and nausea shortly after experiencing a syncopal episode. Appropriate treatment for this patient includes all of the following except. So give me a second here if you want to pause the video to read the answers. So which of the following treatments should we not do for this patient? And the answer for that is A, give a salt-containing solution by mouth. And, and you might be thinking, well, during the, during the uh, PowerPoint here, he said that you could give a, salt, uh, you know, a, a solution by mouth to, to try to help cool them down. That is appropriate if the patient is not at risk for vomiting. So you'll see here in this uh, question, that was the key thing to take away from this one is they complain of weakness and nausea. So they're nauseous, can't give them anything by mouth. So that's why uh, A is, is uh, that's why A is the correct answer here. We do not want to give them anything by mouth. All right, number six, you're assessing a 27 year old woman with a heat related emergency. Her skin is flushed, hot, and moist, and her level of consciousness is decreased. After moving her to a cool environment, managing her airway, and administering oxygen, you should do what? And I'll give you a second. You can pause the video. And the answer to number six is C. You should cover her with cool, moist cloth and fan her. Cover her with a cool, moist cloth and fan her. And she's got a decreased level of consciousness, so I'm not going to give her anything to drink. Uh, placing the patient in the recovery position is not going to help. If anything, we need to place her in the shock position, which is supine. Uh, obviously, the answer there was cool, moist cloth. Uh, and then uh, taking her uh, temperature with an axillary probe. You know, that's not a, a terrible idea, but it's not going to give us a great idea of her core temperature. We need to get a core temperature, and that's through a rectal, a rectal temp. All right, number seven, uh, three ambulances respond to a golf course where a group of six golfers were struck by lightning. Two of the golfers are conscious and alert with superficial skin burns. We're going to call them group one. The next two golfers have minor fractures and appear to be confused. We're going to call them group two. The last two golfers are in cardiac arrest. We'll call them group three. According to reverse triage, which group of golfers should be treated first? Group one, two, three or group one and two, and group three should be tagged as deceased. So reverse triage tells us that group three, 
group three should be the first treated because the other groups are all not in cardiac arrest. They're all, they have all survived the lightning strike. It's unlikely that they will go into cardiac arrest. So we want to attempt to revive the folks who are in cardiac arrest. And that's all we have for Chapter 32, Environmental Emergencies. Uh, take care. We'll see you next time.